Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is Episode 12, Isaac Asimov, Part 1. This is the first of two episodes about Isaac Asimov, who of course was one of the biggest names of sci-fi's golden age in the 1950s. I don't normally give authors two episodes, but I will when their legacy is big enough and touches on enough different points that it takes two episodes to really tell the full story. That applies to Asimov as well as to Robert Heinlein, who will come next. This episode will be an overview of Asimov's general body of work, while part two will discuss him in the context of an introduction to the subject of robots. Asimov is one of what I call the big four authors of the Golden Age. That's not a term you'll hear generally. Most people talk about the big three, who are Asimov, Robert Heinlein, and Arthur C. Clarke. But that list has a major oversight, Ray Bradbury. Bradbury wasn't a pure sci-fi author. He wrote quite a bit of fantasy. Although, for that matter, Asimov wrote mysteries. But Bradbury was a big enough name that he's worthy of the list. And in fact, some people prefer the ABCs over the big three, Asimov, Bradbury, and Clarke. I just go with the big four instead. Isaac Asimov was born to a Russian Jewish family in 1920. Like so many at that time, he immigrated to the United States at age three and became a naturalized citizen at age eight. He was a gifted student, finishing high school at 15, studying zoology and chemistry, working as a civilian chemist for the Navy during World War II, and eventually receiving a PhD after a brief stint in the Army. He eventually became a professor of biochemistry at Boston University, making him the most traditionally accomplished of the Big Four. Clark had a bachelor's degree in math, Heinlein graduated from the Naval Academy, and Bradbury only had a high school diploma. But through all of this, Asimov was writing. He grew up reading the pulp magazines, and he started writing his own stories at age 11. He started thinking about going pro when he was 17, but it was the following year that really got him off the ground. In what may be one of the strangest series of events of this period, the young Asimov noticed that the May 1938 issue of Astounding Science Fiction didn't appear on the newsstands when it was supposed to, and he decided to be proactive about it. He visited the publisher's headquarters to ask around. And that's how he met the magazine's new editor, who had changed the schedule, the notorious John W. Campbell, whom we learned about in the last episode. Campbell actually met with Asimov in person, speaking with him for over an hour before he even read his first story. He rejected that story, but politely, and explaining in detail why he did. What's more, he continued meeting with Asimov and encouraged him to keep writing. He told Asimov that if he practiced for 12 months and wrote 12 stories, he might be able to sell one. In fact, it took Asimov four months and three stories. Campbell may not have thought he was ready, but Raymond Palmer, the editor of Amazing Stories, did, and he bought Asimov's third science fiction story, Marooned Off Vesta, for $64, which was good money in 1938. Campbell himself gave in and bought his first story from Asimov after seven months of coaching. Campbell proved to be a very good friend and mentor to Asimov. The two of them met almost every week when Asimov was in New York for the next 11 years. Campbell, in Asimov's eyes, was the only one who believed in him when he himself didn't. Asimov didn't receive immediate accolades for his work, whereas Heinlein and other Golden Age greats like A.E. Van Vaught did. In fact, in 1942, when he went to work for the Navy, he almost stopped writing and even reading sci-fi entirely. He only stayed connected to the genre because he had the good fortune to be working alongside Heinlein and yet another writer, L. Sprague de Camp. You might know him for coining the term E.T. Mind you, by this time, Asimov had already written Nightfall, some of the Foundation stories, and the first robot stories, all of which are very highly acclaimed today. But it took him a bit longer to get off the ground with the readers of the time. His stories did grow more popular as the war continued, and he sold some that hadn't been published yet, but he still wasn't making enough to live off of them. It was only in the 1950s, after he had already become a professor, that reprints and demand for new novels became lucrative enough for him to support himself as a full-time writer. The first of these novels was Pebble in the Sky in 1950, but much more famous was I, Robot, a fix-up novel published that same year. 
A Fix-Up is an anthology of short stories united by a frame story and often intended to be in the same universe from the start. They were popular in the early years when the focus on the genre was shifting from magazines to books. But iRobot is the subject of the next episode. The first book we'll be taking a close look at right now is Asimov's 1951 fix-up, Foundation. Foundation, or rather the Foundation Trilogy, was a set of nine short stories collected into three books. They tell of a great empire of humanity in the far future, spanning the galaxy, and very much modeled on the Roman Empire. The capital, Trantor, is a planet completely covered by a single massive city, a clear inspiration for Coruscant in the Star Wars universe. And check out my blog for an analysis of whether a planet-spanning city could actually function. It works better than you might expect. But the Empire of Trantor, like the Roman Empire, is in decline. Brilliant mathematician Harry Selden develops a new field called psychohistory, with which he can foresee the future, and the future he sees is the Empire's fall. Psychohistory seems to be based on the real discipline of mathematical sociology, combining psychology and sociology with statistical techniques to predict the future with improbable accuracy. Selden's model predicts that the Empire will soon collapse under its own weight, and civilization will fall into barbarism for 30,000 years. But more than just predicting the future, psychohistory provides the handle to take control of it. Selden calculates the best possible path forward and establishes a foundation that will keep the knowledge and ideals of civilization alive and will rebuild the empire in only 1,000 years. Note that there is also a real, if poorly established, discipline of psychohistory which studies not the future, but the psychology behind historical events in the past. This usage of the term was coined by famous psychologist Eric Erickson in 1958. The Foundation Trilogy follows Selden's foundation as it makes its way through the successive Selden crises, turning points in history at which the foundation must either stand or fall, as it works towards rebuilding the empire. True to Selden's word, they succeed pretty handily, despite reality throwing them some curveballs along the way. Personally, I don't put much stock in psychohistory. You can predict social and economic trends, sure, but chaos theory says that pretty soon things will go astray. The first time you meet a major event with two equally likely outcomes, your ability to predict anything is cut in half. As I'm not an historian, I'll refrain from speculating on specific examples. Nonetheless, the Foundation Trilogy and the idea of psychohistory have had quite the impact. It has inspired not just science aficionados like Carl Sagan and Elon Musk, but also economists and politicians as disparate as Paul Krugman and Newt Gingrich. As for the writing, Asimov's prose is sparse, informal, and very plot-driven. He rarely gets into deep character studies like the authors of The New Wave would a decade later. As editor of Astounding, Campbell had pushed the genre to be more character-driven, but only in his own conservative way. And I think Asimov, whose short stories were literally his bread and butter, demonstrates this. This is one of the reasons I consider Asimov not to be the best author of the Golden Age, although even not the best makes for a huge impact, as we see with Foundation. Asimov's most famous writings are probably the Robot series, and his Three Laws of Robotics are foundational to the entire subgenre of robotics. But that's the subject of the next episode. For now, I'll just note that these series were in fact connected. Despite the lack of robots in Foundation, in his later books he merged them together, both with more Foundation books and others that portray the Empire in its rising. The large majority of Asimov's novels are connected with this extended Robots Empire Foundation series. The main exceptions are The End of Eternity, which still has a loose connection, The Gods Themselves, and Fantastic Voyage. So let's take a look at those. Fantastic Voyage was actually not Asimov's story. It was a novelization of the movie of the same name, which was mistakenly published six months before the film was released. The original screenwriters were Otto Clement and Jerome Bixby of the Twilight Zone fame. The Gods Themselves, written in 1972, was an atypical story for Asimov. 
This was after the new wave transformed the genre with its emphasis on character-driven stories and social issues. Asimov disliked the new wave, but you can clearly see its influence. For one, the middle third of the book is written from the perspective of aliens living in a parallel universe. Aliens who have three sexes and are made of matter so exotic that they can pass through solid objects. And for another, the book is an allegory for the environmental movement. The basic premise is that in the future, humans discover a revolutionary new energy source that allows them to extract power from the parallel universe. Because of the way the physics works, the aliens on the other side can extract power too. It's free energy for all. But the bad news is that exchanging energy between the two universes will slowly distort the physics of both and eventually destroy them. The title of the book is a quote from the play The Maid of Orléans by Friedrich Schiller, which reads, Against stupidity, the gods themselves contend in vain. You can probably see where this is going. Asimov has a solution prepared, which might be a bit of a cop-out, but as an exercise in writing the other, it's impressive work. And in yet another of the stranger incidents in the history of sci-fi, the entire novel came about from an offhand remark from Asimov's friend Robert Silverberg. In a conversation where Silverberg needed to refer to an isotope, any isotope, as an example of whatever he was talking about, he chose plutonium-186. Asimov pointed out that this isotope doesn't exist. In response, Silverberg dared him to write a story about it, which is where the parallel universe came from, and the rest is history. The End of Eternity, on the other hand, is a bit more conventional and is a detailed account of the complications of time travel. In this story, Eternity is an organization of time travelers who are constantly tweaking the timeline to, in their estimation, increase human happiness. However, the cost of these interventions often comes in the form of art, industrial development, and even technology that are never realized, not to mention people. For example, nuclear power was not invented until centuries later than it was in the real world because Eternity judged nuclear weapons to be too large a drawback to be worth it. The consequences of this turn out to be far greater than Eternity itself knows. Amid this great work, Andrew Harlan is one of Eternity's best time travelers, and his hobby happens to be studying the primitive times before time travel was invented. However, when he falls in love with Noyes Lambent, an aristocrat from the future who is slated to be erased by an alteration in an earlier century, he takes drastic action to save her. Time travel, when it takes the time to really explore its implications, can be a lot of fun, and the end of eternity is no exception. The consequences of modifying timelines while the engine is running, so to speak, studying the consequences up when while still making changes down when, and disentangling time loops and paradoxes caused by the character's actions, results in an uncommonly good and entertaining analysis of the subject. But in addition to these novels, Asimov wrote a great many short stories. And of the big four, he is the only one who is probably more famous for his short stories than his novels. People remember I, Robot more than The Caves of Steel, and Foundation more than The End of Eternity. The most famous of his stories are, of course, collected in the Robot and Foundation anthologies, but a few others have achieved fame on their own, and the two most important of these are undoubtedly Nightfall and The Last Question. The third is probably The Ugly Little Boy, about a Neanderthal brought to the present via time travel. These are his three really famous standalones. Incidentally, Asimov later expanded Nightfall and The Ugly Little Boy into full-length novels, along with The Bicentennial Man, with the help of Robert Silverberg, so even he recognized their significance. Nightfall is about a planet in a six-star solar system, where at least one sun is always in the sky. The alien civilization living there has never seen true darkness, and knows nothing of the distant stars. But scientists studying the orbits of the suns discover that there will soon be a total solar eclipse, which occurs once every 2,000 years. On seeing the night sky darkened and filled with stars, the people go insane and civilization collapses. And guess what? This story was John W. Campbell's idea. We just can't get away from that guy, can we? Campbell was considering the quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, quote, if the stars should appear one night in a thousand years, 
How would men believe and adore and preserve for many generations the remembrance of the city of God? Unquote. Campbell's response was, quote, I think men would go mad, unquote. and he challenged Asimov to write the story. Nightfall was later voted the best science fiction short story ever written, although that was in 1968, so there's a lot more competition now. The last question was Asimov's personal favorite of his writings, and one that seemed to stick with his readers, too. In his later years, Asimov said that whenever someone asked about one of his stories that they remembered the premise of, but not the title, the answer was invariably the last question. This story wouldn't lend itself so well to novelization, and even if it did, it certainly doesn't need it. This is one of those rare ideas that is received in a flash of inspiration, and written in one sitting in nearly its final form, exactly the way it needs to be. It's the story of the great computer AC, named for the then brand new Univac, which is asked again and again by the descendants of humanity if there is a way to reverse entropy and prevent the heat death of the universe. And each time AC replies, there is insufficient data for a meaningful answer. And I don't want to spoil it. Seriously, just go and read it. It's free online, and you can read it in half an hour. You'll be glad you did. Before I finish, I should note that Asimov did not write only science fiction. In fact, he had an incredible diversity of output. A widespread internet factoid claims that Asimov wrote books in all ten categories of the Dewey Decimal System, but he actually missed the 100s, philosophy and psychology. Even so, he wrote chemistry textbooks, and a huge variety of popular nonfiction about science, mathematics, history, linguistics, religion, and literature. He had a monthly nonfiction column in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, even as he served as the editorial director for another magazine, Asimov Science Fiction. Both are still popular today. Then there are his three autobiographies, two mystery novels and many short stories, a series of children's books, several joke books that weren't particularly for children, and even five collections of dirty limericks. He's gotten some attention from Me Too in recent years. In fact, Asimov was so prolific with nonfiction that he nearly stopped writing science fiction entirely in 1958, publishing only a couple of new sci-fi books until he returned to the genre in his later years in 1982. Despite this, he still self-identified as a science fiction writer for his whole life, and with this much output, it should be no surprise that we're leaving some of it for the next episode. So consider this to be continued. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is available on Libsyn, YouTube, and a bunch of other places. And at my website, sciencemeetsfiction.com, where I also analyze the scientific plausibility of Trantor. My book recommendation for this episode is The End of Eternity, Choosing any full-length novel might not be very representative of Asimov, but I think it's better than the Foundation Trilogy, and it's definitely more representative of the Golden Age than the gods themselves, so I'm sticking with that. Honorable mention to the last question, of course. I mean it. Go read it. Link's in the description. In the next episode, we'll continue with Isaac Asimov, but also branch out a bit, because he is only part of the story there. It's time to take a close look at a particular topic in sci-fi that is inextricably linked with Asimov, robots. Thanks for listening.